Hi, my name is Richard Cook, and we're going to talk a little bit about the marvelous resilience of bone and its relationship to resilience engineering. This is a simple talk about complex systems. Well, as simple as we can make it. It is a complex system. It's got lots of moving parts, and there's a lot of complexity here. But we're going to try and simplify it out so we can see the really important bits that relate to res resilience and also to, to DevOps. I'm going to begin by asserting this. Bone is not a model of or a metaphor for resilience. Bone is the archetype of resilience. Whenever resilience is brought up, whenever you hear that word, whenever there's a discussion about it, I hope that you will think about bone whenever the subject of resilience comes up. Resilience in bone is the, is the source of information about what resilience really is. And if you're looking at something and asking, is this resilience or is this resilience engineering, I hope that bone will come to mind for you. If bone is the archetype of resilience, what then is resilience engineering? Well, we're going to try and answer that question, and I think you might be a bit surprised at the answer. Bone's resilience, first of all, is fairly what I would call Woodsian, that is, it fits David Wood's uh, last two descriptions of uh, resilience, the first being graceful extensibility, the second being sustained adaptability. Uh, key features of Bones resilience are that it's expensive, it requires a continual input of energy and resources, it's delicate, it can be disrupted by loss of feedback, it's susceptible to disease, and it's somewhat limited. It has a peak and then diminishes over time. It doesn't last forever. It lasts for someone's lifetime. It's got a limit to it. Now, the, th the most remarkable thing about bone is that it's being continuously remodeled. The adult skeleton is replaced every 10 years. The making of bo bone is in dynamic balance with the destroying of bone. So you don't really notice that it's undergoing remodeling. To you, the, the skeleton seems relatively static, but that's because the balance between new bone being created and old bone being chewed up is kept so that there's just about a constant amount of bone and the structure feels very stable. It's also important to note that the, the demolition and construction of bone happens along lines of mechanical strain. The kind of placement of bone is dependent upon where the mechanical strain lies. Bone repair, what happens when you break a bone, is an extension of the remodeling process that engages some additional mechanisms. We'll talk a bit about repair. An important quality of bone is that it's a primary store in the body for essential elements, notably calcium and phosphorus. Calcium is the most important element in the body. We only have about a kilogram of it, and most of it is stored in bone. But it's absolutely essential to have calcium around to do all of the contractile activities, both intracellular and extracellular, that make up the activity of the body. Finally, bone and its resilience really arrives, uh, derives from signaling. There's no master controller for all this. There's just a messy layered network with lots of crosstalk between the organism, the anatomical regions, the cellular and intracellular uh, activities that are going on. All of these are involved in various kinds of signaling that helps direct bone and cause it to be laid down and chewed up. Now, bone has both a complex macro and micro architecture. The macro architecture is something you've probably seen before. The exterior of the bone, what we call compact bone, is solid and stiff. And then there's this kind of woven, spongy looking material in the middle, cancellous bone. There's, at a microscopic level, a much more complex architecture that relates to where the cells are actually located and how they're communicating with each other. Bone undergoes continuous remodeling. The use of bone mass is energetically efficient. That is, we don't have a lot of calcium to make bone from, so we need to put bone exactly where it will do us the most good. That is, particularly along the lines of strain that, it, that the bone is trying to resist. Regular strain leads to a regular pattern. That is, if you cut through the bones of multiple different people and look at the section side by side, they look very much the same. This pattern is tuned. The organism is prepared for future stress by the kinds of bony patterns that are built up as bone is laid down. 
the pattern emerges. It's not programmed. There's no molecular signal that says make the bone in this particular pattern. In this picture that you see in the upper left, the, the head of the femur, you can see a line that crosses it about midway through. That line is actually produced by the pattern of strain that's going on in the bone over a lifetime. And it's not programmed in a kind of molecular way. It's an emergent property of the bone. This remodeling that goes on is very complicated. There are uh, cells which specifically lay down bone. They're called osteoblasts. And cells that chew up bone and, and return the calcium back into circulation, those are called osteoclasts. The balance between these two kinds of cells is what leads to the re realignment of structural strength to fit the needs of the body. There's both local direction in terms of the strain lines that are sensed by these cells and cause bone to be laid down along those lines, and global modulation in the sense that the, the parathyroid is controlling the amount of calcium and the overall function of osteoclasts. It's this mechanism that is responsible for the repair of microfractures that's happening all the time. And it's also this mechanism that allows us to recycle calcium and potassium, and more importantly, to have a constant supply of calcium ready for use. Calcium has to be regulated in a very narrow region, and this is done by having the osteoclasts constantly chewing up bone using hydrochloric acid that they secrete and returning that calcium back into the circulation where it can be used for contraction. As I said, there's only about a kilogram of calcium in the body, and it's, it's most of it, 99% of it, is stored up in bone. It's absorbed from the intestine under the influence of vitamin D. It's excreted from the kidney, under the, again, under the incidence of, uh, influence of parathyroid hormone. But the key thing is that the, both the macro and the micro scales are interacting here. The signals that are happening down at the cellular level have to do with the overall levels of calcium in the body, which are sensed by the parathyroid and controlled there by secretion of parathyroid hormone and calcitonin. Remodeling is balanced, continuous, and energy consuming. It happens that bone is being laid down and chewed up in about the ratio that is one to one, so that overall you don't feel like your skeleton is changing its characteristics very much. That signaling is fiendishly complex. There's at least 20 or more signals, molecular signals, that are provided uh, that have influence over that. And among those signals is one called PTHRP, the parathyroid hormone-related protein. We'll come back to this in a, a little while. But just to recognize that all of the signaling going on here is this very dense network of, of uh, communication by various kinds of uh, chemicals that are being sensed and excreted by the cells that make up the bony uh, uh, active surface. Here's an example. Here's a 25-year-old man who reported that he, quote, kicked a lamppost in a fit of anger and later noted that he had, quote, difficulty walking. One might suspect that alcohol was involved. In the radiograph on the left, even those of you who aren't very medically experienced will be able to see that there's clearly something wrong here. In fact, this man has a mid-shaft fracture of his tibia. Now, we know that this will heal together. Over time, after the, after the initial injury, there'll be a period of time that lasts for a few days during which there'll be a hematoma, that is a blood clot with lots of very active substances there that call in cells of cartilage that fill up that space and that are gradually replaced with this woven bone to form what's called a callus. A callus is a thick, uh, hefty structure. Those of you who've broken a, your, your radius or your um, clavicle will have felt that there's a lump there for a period of time afterwards. That's the callus. And what it is is bone that hasn't yet been well incorporated into the uh, structure of the bone that's being repaired. Over time, the normal remodeling process, guided again by strain, is going to smooth down that callus, take away a lot of that bone, being very uh, efficient as it does so, until it's smoothed down until you don't really notice it anymore. Now this happens whether or not the bone is well aligned. Here's a picture of uh, the results of a, an excavation, archeologic excavation in Chile uh, of uh, probably about a 50 year old woman from about 1400 AD who at some point had broken her femur. 
You can see the break very clearly has healed. The two ends of the bone are well connected to each other, but you also see that it's got a very rough kind of uh, big chunky look to it. And noticeably in the middle, of picture, the middle picture, you can see that the healed femur is now at least an inch and a half shorter than the other one. This lady would have walked if she walked at all with a really profound limp. This is resilience. The bone is knitting together. It, all of those mechanisms that we just talked about were active in this woman to cause that fracture to heal. The problem is that it didn't heal in a very functional way. Now, we don't have so much of a problem with this now because we understand how bone works and how it will heal. So if you break something like your radius, you're going to find that uh, the bone will be uh, first of all, reduced, the fracture will be reduced so that the ends are in alignment, and then stabilized by application of a cast to hold the ends in a position to allow that resilient mechanism to be able to knit the bone together in a functional way. Mechanical stabilization is the key here. The reduction is something that happens fairly quickly, but oh, it takes time for the bone to heal, and so it must be stabilized in that position for long enough for the bone to build up that callus and regain some of its strength to hold it in alignment. This business about finding ways to fix or stabilize bone is part of what we now think of as orthopedic surgery. Much of orthopedic surgery is about how to reduce and fixate broken bones so that they will heal together. On the left, you see external fixators. These are devices that are applied outside of the skin, usually with screws that are driven into the bone and then connected together by a rigid apparatus so that the two ends of the bone are held in alignment. Another type of fixation is called internal fixation. This is where surgery is done. The skin is opened up, the bone is exposed, and then the bone is held in position uh, either by applying a plate with some screws or putting in a nail. On the right-hand side, you see an example of this. This is uh, what's called an intramedullary nail. The long uh, white object is a piece of steel uh, or titanium that has been driven down. You essentially take the patient and you hold them in a position so that the head of the femur is sticking out so that you can get at it. And you take a, uh, this nail and a hammer and you drive the nail down all the way in the length until it bridges the space where the break has occurred. And then that little thing at the top, that little pin is driven in to help hold it in place. You can see why I have chosen to be an anesthesiologist. The key idea here, though, has been known for a very long time. The idea of producing both reduction and fixation goes back to the ancients. Uh, in fact, these splints were found in a tomb from the pharaohs from at least a few thousand BC. And the Edwin Smith Papyrus, the first medical textbook that we know of, uh, authored somewhere around 1600 BC, uh, talks about this explicitly. Uh, the hieroglyphs in there are reproduced here in one figure on the left. And because your hieroglyphics are probably a little rusty, I'll read to you what it says on the right. Uh, it says, "Thou." Sh this is for somebody who's broken their upper arm. And it, uh, the instructions to the bone setter are, you should place him prostrate on his back with something folded between his two shoulder blades. You should spread out his two shoulders in order to stretch apart his upper arm until that break falls into place. You should make for him two splints of linen and apply one of them both on the inside of his arm and the other on both on the underside of his arm. You should bind it up with, and then there's this word, yermu, which we think might have been uh, ancient Egyptian for plaster of Paris, but Paris hadn't been invented yet. And treated afterwards with honey every day until he recovers. This is very sound medical advice. If you do this, someone with a broken humerus is very likely to be able to regain function of that arm. And if you don't, it's very likely that they will never regain that function. Isn't this a kind of resilience engineering? The body is resilient, the bone will knit, but our understanding of how that resilience works allows us to engineer a solution that, that makes it so that the resilience plays out in such a way that the result is a good one. Physicians don't heal broken bones. What they do is realign the broken bones so that the natural process of healing, this resilience of the body, plays out in such a way that the end result is a good one. 
this is a key notion about resilience engineering. This is a kind of resilience engineering that's applied to an already resilient system. It depends upon the resilience that are, is already present in that system. It requires some understanding of how resilience will play out. For example, how long you have to keep the bone stabilized uh, in a position to allow it to heal. But it can be successful even without knowing much about the underlying mechanisms of the resilience. The ancients obviously did not know about cells or any of the signaling going on, but they were still successful at setting these bones. They could do resilience engineering. There is benefit, of course, to knowing what modulates the resilience. Good nutrition aids bone healing, and this has been known for a very long time. The marvelous resilience of bone, just to review, is somehow related to its being a storehouse for calcium. It's a function of being continuous replacement. That is, we don't call upon the resilience only when something is broken. It's running there all the time, and that provides the opportunity for us to deal with something like a fracture that there's this process of taking away the old and adding the new that gives us calcium, access to calcium. And the balance between destruction and construction has local and global regulation. There's a lot of regulatory features that make this resilience work. But as Hughes observed in Tom Brown Schoolboys, life isn't all beer and Skittles. This resilience isn't perfect. Bone isn't a perfect thing. There are diseases of bone. For instance, osteogenesis imperfecta, which is a condition where people do not actually ca uh, calcify their bones and they stay weak and, and easily broken. Paget's disease is a disease that causes a kind of moth-eaten appearance on radiographs and loss of structure in the bone. Osteoporosis, you may know, is a disease or a condition found in old age where the bone loses its density. There are cancers of bone, for example, osteosarcoma, which are terrible cancers. And there's rickets and malnutrition, something we don't see much in this country anymore, but that as recently as 100 years ago was fairly common. And there are disorders of hormonal regulation, the parathyroid, which is related to uh, how much calcium is present and, and directs the resorption of bone, can get out of regulation such that you will be chewing up bone and having very high serum calciums. Let's talk about that osteoporosis thing for just a moment. It's a very interesting area. It's, it's a problem that's seen with increasing age, especially in women. Uh, it's responsible for a lot of morbidity and mortality in the US. Many hip fractures and vertebral fractures are the result of osteoporosis. What is osteoporosis? Well, it's a loss of bone density over time. You see here on the left, the a uh, piece of vertebrae from a young person, and on, uh, to the right of that is uh, the osteoporotic vertebrae in two different looks uh, from an elderly adult. Osteoporosis is more common in women, particularly after menopause, and this is because the hormone estrogen has a lot to do with the production of bone uh, and the laying down of bone. The problem here, of course, is that the balance is no longer good. That is, the, the osteoclasts are doing more than the osteoblasts are doing, and so over time, bone mass is being lost. There are some new therapies that have been developed to uh, address this medical condition. And they're mostly therapies that are trying to change the balance between the osteoblastic creation of bone and the osteoclastic uh, resorption of bone. It doesn't make everything better. We just tip the balance slightly in the favor of the osteoblast or reduce the activity slightly of the osteoclast. Reducing osteoclastic activity, some, sometimes by giving estrogen or other um, bifos, bisphosphonates, uh, is something that's been done for the past 20 years or so. More recently, it's become clear that it's possible to use the specific signaling related to the resilience of bone to increase osteoblastic activity. Remember that I told you about this PTHRP, the parathyroid hormone uh, protein. It's possible to synthesize this, and, and there are some new drugs that actually take the role of PTHRP and send signals that cause the osteoblasts to create more bone. This idea of the parathyroid hormone-related protein being added is a powerful one. I point out here that in comparison to things like adding calcium to your diet, there's tons
tiny, tiny amounts. To get calcium to be effective, you have to take grams and grams of the stuff. But the parathyroid hormone is given in microgram amounts. That's a millionth of a gram because it's actually one of the signals about resilience that changes the function of the osteoblasts. There's studies that show that this actually works very well. It reduces the risk of, of vertebral fractures compared to placebo by 91%. This is a tremendous improvement and it's substantially important because it may reduce the, the very severe morbidity and mortality associated with vertebral fractures and possibly uh, hip fractures in elderly. Again, it's not all Skittles and beer. There are potential problems with this. So there are some studies in animals that show that if you give large doses of this PTHRH, uh, uh, you can end up producing tumors in some of the animals exposed. So it's not obvious that this thing is without side effects and there may be some risks attached to it. But this is another type of resilience engineering is different from the first one that we saw. This type of resilience engineering acts on resilience mechanisms themselves. It goes inside the things that produce resilience and tries to make an adjustment to that. It depends, therefore, on a much deeper understanding of resilience than was the case where we were simply employing the existing resilience and engineering so that the results of that playing out would be to our liking. It has an effect of sustaining the adaptive capacity. It's not just about fixing broken things like orthopedic uh, surgery has been. It's actually a way of preventing things from happening in the future. It sustains the adaptive capacity of the organism, but it also probably generates some new types of hazards, some of which are not well yet, uh, not yet well understood. So we see that there are two different kinds of resilience engineering, one that's about 3,500 years old and the other that's about five years old. The oldest one depends upon resilience that's already present and our understanding of how resilience plays out. We apply engineering to an already resilient system and we can be successful without knowing too much about the mechanisms that underlie that resilience. On the other hand, there's this newer type which acts directly on resilience mechanisms, depends upon a quite qualified and deep understanding of resilience. Uh, and admittedly probably generates some new types of hazards because it's actually tweaking the signaling that's going on. What relevance does this have to DevOps? Well, the first, I would, first observation I would make is there's a lot of claims about resilience in IT. You'll see the word used very often and perhaps even in some of your own companies. There are diverse uses of the word that don't agree on what its meaning is. Um, there's a lot of use of it that implies that resilience is sort of a super reliability or an increment to reliability, that reliability, that resilience is after reliability or what you get if you go a little bit further. And if you look at some of the marketing materials that are prepared, it looks almost like people have substituted the word resilience for the word reliability. However, there is resilience here. It's just not obvious to us because it's above the line. We've talked about the difference between above the line and below the line. Above the line being the people, the organization, the activities, the cognitive work that surrounds the systems that are running, the technology that's below the line, and this line of representation that exists in between the two, which is what we look at since we never can see anything actually functioning below the line. There's lots of resilience in the system, but the resilience is in the people. The resilience is in the DevOps activities. The people are constantly tweaking the system, looking at it, understanding how to maintain it, doing things that are resilient in terms of the way that they influence the system and also exploit the resilience that is present there. There's resilience engineering going on here already. Now, we've talked about this a little bit. There's an article in ACMQ that some of you will know. And there's another article coming out in uh, Applied Ergonomics uh, shortly between, with uh, my colleague Beth Long and I writing about building and revising adaptive capacity uh, in incident response uh, as an in indication or a case of resilience engineering. But the key idea here is that there is resilience in IT systems, but the resilience is not in the places where we are normally looking for it. Resilience is above the line. I hope that this uh, introduction to resilience has changed your view about what resilience is. And I hope when resilience is mentioned in the future that you will think about bone 
And when resilience engineering is discussed, that you'll think about both orthopedic surgery and giving PTHRP to forestall fractures in the future. These are really, really good examples that you can hold on to and use when someone says, oh, we have resilience or we're doing resilience engineering. My idea is that unless they match up very well with what's going on in bone and the resilience engineering around bone, they're not really the kind of resilience engineering that I'm thinking about most of the time. Thank you very much for your time.